Hello, cats and kittens. Mm. Time for another pulp reading. Uh, today I'm going to go back to Dashiell Hammett and uh, the first novel he ever wrote using his series character, The Continental Op. The Continental Op uh, is, turns out to be the blueprint for a lot of pop culture heroes that you've seen later uh, in things that were not pulp fiction. Um, Red Harvest's story was first adapted as a film uh, unofficially by Akira Kurosawa, who made it into a samurai movie called Yojimbo. Um, and then Sergio Leone made it into a Western called A Fistful of Dollars, uh, both of which had sort of nameless heroes. Um, you don't really notice right away reading the Red Harvest that the main character called the Continental Op, because he is an operative of the Continental Detective Agency. You don't really notice he doesn't have a name until a few, about 10, 15 pages in, he meets a man who asks his name. And it's a first person singular book narrated by the main character. And he says, I told him John or Johnson or Jones or something like that. And you go, oh, wait a minute, I don't know, I don't know what this guy's name is. Anyway, the Continental Op incredibly uh, influential pop culture character. Um, Walter Hill had the rights to Red Harvest for years, uh, lost them at some point, and when he came time to make his version of Red Harvest, he bought the remake rights of Yojimbo, which I guess were cheaper, and made uh, Last Man Standing, which, if you've read this book, is incredibly disappointing. He should have just stuck with Red Harvest. Um, I won't tell you what it is, but the second act curtain, if you break the book into a three act like it's a movie, second act curtain has never been topped and weirdly never been ripped off. Um, but that's it. Let's uh, just want to read you the first two and a half pages roughly of uh, Red Harvest because here's this is, this is the sound of a man more or less inventing a genre. Red Harvest, chapter one. A woman in green and a man in gray. I first heard Personville called Poisonville by a red-haired mucker named Hickey Dewey in the big ship in Butte. He also called his shirt a shoik. I didn't think anything of what he had done to the city's name. Later, later I heard men who could manage their R's give it the same pronunciation. I still didn't see any, anything in it but the meaningless sort of humor that used to make Richard's nary the thieves' word for dictionary. A few years later, I went to Personville and learned better. Using one of the phones at the station, I called the Herald, asked for Donald Wilson, told him I had arrived. Will you come out to my house at 10 this evening? He had a pleasantly crisp voice. It's 2101 Mountain Boulevard. Take a Broadway car, get off at Laurel Avenue, walk two blocks west. I promised to do that. Then I rode up to the Great Western Hotel, dumped my bags, and went out to look at the city. It wasn't pretty. Most of its builders had gone in for gaudiness. Maybe they had been successful at first. Since then, the smelters whose brick stacks stuck up tall against a gloomy mountain to the south had yellow-smoked everything into uniform dinginess. The result was an ugly city of 40,000 people set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains that had been all dirtied up by mining. Spread over this was a grimy sky that looked as if it had come out of the smelters' stacks. The first policeman I saw needed to shave. The second had a couple of buttons off his shabby uniform. The third stood in the center of the city's main intersection, Broadway and Union Street, directing traffic with a cigar in one corner of his mouth. After that, I start ch stopped checking them up. At 9.30, I caught a Broadway car and followed the directions Donald Wilson had given me. They brought me to a house set in a hedged grass plot on a corner. The maid who opened the door told me Mr. Wilson wasn't at home. While I was explaining that I had an appointment with him, a slender blonde woman of something less than 30 in green crepe came to the door. When she smiled, her blue eyes didn't lose their stoniness. I repeated my explanation to her. My husband isn't in now. A barely noticeable accent slurred her S's. But if he's expecting you, he'll probably be home shortly. She took me upstairs to a room on the Laurel Avenue side of the house, a brown and red room with lots of books in it. 
who sat in leather chairs, half facing each other, half facing a burning coal grate, and she set about learning my business with her husband. Do you live in Personville? she asked Bert. No, San Francisco. But this is your first visit. Yes. Really? How do you like our city? I haven't seen of it, enough of it to know. That was a lie. Bad. I got in only this afternoon. Her shiny eyes stopped crying while she said, You'll find it a dreary place. She returned it to her digging with, I suppose all mining towns are like this. Are you engaged in mining? Not just now. She looked at the clock on the mantel and said, It's inconsiderate of Donald to bring you out here and then keep you waiting at this time of night, long after business hours. I said that was all right. Though perhaps this isn't a business matter, she suggested. I didn't say anything. She laughed. A short laugh with something sharp in it. I'm not really ordinarily so much of a busybody as you probably think, she said gaily. But you're so excessively secretive that I can't help being curious. You aren't a bootlegger, are you? Donald changes them so often. I let her get whatever she could out of her grin. The telephone bell rang downstairs. Mrs. Wilson stretched her green slippered feet out toward the burning coal and pretended she hadn't heard the bell. I didn't know why she thought that was necessary. She began, I'm afraid I'll ha and stopped to look at the maid in the doorway. The maid said Mrs. Wilson was wanted at the phone. She excused herself and followed the maid out. She didn't go downstairs, but spoke over an extension within earshot. I heard, Mrs. Wilson speaking. Yes. I beg your pardon. Who? Can't you speak a little louder? What? Yes. Yes. Who is this? Hello, hello. The telephone hook rattled. Her steps st sounded down the hallway. Rapid step. I set fire to a cigarette and stared at it until I heard her going down the step. Then I went to a window, lifted an edge of the blind, and looked out on Laurel Avenue and at the square white garage that stood in the rear of the house on that side. Presently, a slender woman in a dark coat and hat came into sight, hurrying from house to garage. It was Mrs. Wilson. She drove away in a Buick coupe. I went back to my chair and waited. Three quarters of an hour went by. At five minutes after eleven, automobile brakes screeched outside. Two minutes later, Mrs. Wilson came into the room. She had taken off hat and coat. Her face was white, her eyes almost black. I'm awfully sorry, she said, her tight-lipped mouth moving jerkily. But you've had all this waiting for nothing. My husband won't be home tonight. I said I would get in touch with him at the Herald in the morning. I went away, wondering why the green toe of her left slipper was dark and damp with something that could have been blood. And that's how you open a mystery story. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Dashiell Hammett continental op short stories that led up to him writing that first novel. Uh, and there's a second continental op uh, book called The Dane Curse, which is good, but of Hammett's five novels, it is definitely a solid number five in uh, quality and interest. It's good that he... Uh, he lost interest in writing a series character almost immediately, uh, at least in novels, anyway. Uh, that's today's reading. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out Red Harvest. It's one of my favorite novels of all time, and it's again, it's it, it's a it's a it's a genre, a new kind of novel, a new kind of voice being born, and it's really worth reading. Thanks for watching.